card on this thing. And new page. So use the Pythagorean identity to figure out where this is at on the unit circle. Well, if we draw the unit circle, the coordinate system in there, and there's some theta where that measurement is 1 and that measurement is 4, right? Yeah. Now, on the unit circle, let me think about this for a minute. Use the Pythagorean identity to find the exact coordinates. Well, let's see here. Can't really use my picture because that's got a hypo uh, uh, four as the long side of that triangle. So let's see what they want us to do here. If the sine of theta equals one fourth, and we know, oh, I know what we do. First of all, the point on the unit circle. That's the cosine of theta, and that's the sine of theta. That's the x-coordinate, that's the y-coordinate. For example, let's take one that's a little more recognizable. Hold on. The 30-60 triangle. Or that's 1, that's 2, and that's square root of 3. Now, if this was 30 degrees, how come my eraser isn't working? There we go. Let me redraw that. Let's say that that's 30 degrees. And it's a unit circle, so that's 1. Okay. Now, notice that the cosine of 30 degrees equals the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, like that, which makes the x-coordinate the cosine of that angle. And notice what the sine of 30 degrees is. It's the y-coordinate over the hypotenuse, which means the y-coordinate is the sine of 30 degrees. So no matter where you're at on the unit circle, this point is the cosine of theta, comma, the sine of theta. That's its x and y-coordinate. Okay? So they're telling us the sine of theta is one-fourth. So I can write one-fourth right there. That's the y-coordinate. Now i got to figure out what the cosine of that angle is. Well, the one thing you can do when they give you the value of one trig function and you're trying to figure out the value of another one is draw a right triangle. Label theta. We don't know what theta is. We don't care. What I do know is that in this triangle that I drew, that side's 1 and that side's 4. And now use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out this side. What's the bottom side? I don't know. Well, the Pythagorean theorem, the hypotenuse squared equals the sum of the other two sides squared. 
So if I'm trying to solve for side, I'm not going to call it x because that will be confusing. If I'm trying to solve for this bottom side here, we'll call it z, well, I know that the sine of theta is 1 over 4, and the cosine of theta is z over 4. But I, I can solve for z. In other words, whenever you have a right triangle and you know two sides, you can always solve for the third side. This is the square root of 4 squared minus 1 squared, or square root of 15. So that's that bottom side. Now tell me what the cosine of theta is. Um, it's uh, uh, y over x. So katoa, know this really, really good. It's opposite over adjacent. That's what the O and the A mean. Okay? So, I'm sorry, we're looking at cosine. It's adjacent over the hypotenuse. So if I'm looking for the cosine of theta, the only adjacent side is root 15. There's actually two of them, but they always mean the one that's not the hypotenuse. So the cosine of theta, based on my picture, is root 15 divided by 4. And that's what goes into that spot right there is root 15 divided by 4. If the sine of theta is 1 fourth, then that allows me to figure out what the cosine of theta is. And the x and y coordinates are cosine of theta, comma, sine of theta. So root 15 over 4. What do we do again? Do you have a way of putting the answer in, or? Yeah. Did I put in answers last time? I don't think so. Uh, no. You did on your end? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and put in root 15 over 4. Should be correct. Uh, point 0.968. Mm, you know what? Stay away from decimals. Trig is all about ratios. And there's no way you can give me a decimal that is not an approximation of that number. If you want the exact value of the cosine of theta, the best answer is root 15 divided by 4. That's the best answer you can put in not some decimal number. They might accept the decimal number, but you're going to have to round it off. Who knows if you're rounding it off to the right number of uh, places. So you definitely want to put in root 15 divided by 4. That's the exact answer. look at point P. Remember what I said the coordinates were? What are the coordinates going to be? The X and Y coordinates? The X is going to be what? Cosine. Cosine of 50 degrees. That's the X coordinate. Comma. What's the Y coordinate? Yeah, sine of 50. Okay. So they may want a number on this. They may just accept cosine of 50, comma, sine of 50. Now let's look at point Q. What is the x-coordinate of Q? Uh, cosine of 110. And the y-coordinate? Uh, sine of 110. Yeah. And like I said, they may accept that as an answer, or they may make you look that up on your calculator and put in the number. But the key thing they're trying to get across here 
is that on the unit circle, every point on the circumference, the x-coordinate is the cosine of that angle, the y-coordinate is the sine of that angle. Boy, they sure make you uh, go round about to get back to the next problem, huh? Do I really have to do all of that? Yeah, I think so. Here, let me uh, see if I can draw this picture. The measurement of ROS is 60 degrees. Our coordinate system through there. That's R. And they're saying that is 60 degrees with S being notice they've drawn the little triangle for us. Okay, mm -hmm. so the curved arrow represents the rotation of the ray OR. In other words, they're saying that the ray OR is achieved by making that angle. What is that angle that I just drew? Uh, 60 degrees. 60 degrees if I measure it clockwise from the right. In other words, um, all angles are measured clockwise are negative angles. Counterclockwise are positive angles. So in reality, this is a negative 60 degree angle, technically speaking. But to get the positive angle, measuring it counterclockwise, well, what is it in the first quadrant? How far is that? 90. How far around one second quadrant? 180. Third quadrant? 270. What's this extra little angle here? Plus 30. So that's a 300 degree angle. And that's the answer to A. OR has rotated 300 degrees. Now, are you still uh, exclusively in degrees or a mixture of radians and some degrees or what? Well, I think a mixture. Okay, so you know about radians. Mm -hmm. Okay. Part B, if OR equals 1, making it a unit circle, what are the exact length of OS and SR? Um, OS is a uh, 1 half. And then SR is negative. Hold on. Uh, Let's, you might be right. I was thinking about this for a minute. So what we're really looking at is a triangle like this. Okay. And they're telling us that's 1. And they're telling us that angle is 60 degrees. And they want to know what X is. And they want to know what Y is. Well, what can I say? Give me a trig function that's going to let me solve for x or y. Uh, they want to know what OS is, which is what I've labeled x, and they want to know what SR is, which I've labeled y. So what trig function allows me to get the answers for these? What's the um, cosine of 60 degrees going to be equal to in our in our triangle? Uh, 
Y. Cosine is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. You see why X is the adjacent side to 60 degrees? Yeah. Okay. So the cosine of 60 degrees is X over 1, or just X. And what is the cosine of 60 degrees? It's 1 half. You correctly got that. That calculator would tell you that also. So this side is 1 half. And now to figure out why, well, that's the sine of 60 degrees equals y over 1. And the sine of 60 degrees is root 3 over 2. Again, do not turn that into a decimal. Root 3 over 2 is one of your most common answers in trig. Come, it's a lot because of this 30-60 triangle. Root 3 is one of the sides. So that distance from S to R is root 3 over 2. Okay. What are the exact coordinates of point R? Here's point R right here. Okay, um, it's a uh, one half comma negative square root of three divided by two. Okay, one half is the x coordinate for sure. The y coordinate is it plus or minus square root of three over two. Plus. Or minus? Minus. If you look at the picture, we can see it's in negative territory. Well, why is it minus? Well, how do we get that for the coordinates of R? Remember what the X coordinate is? It's the cosine of theta. And the Y coordinate is the sine of theta. Well, in the fourth quadrant, the cosine of theta is positive. So it's just the cosine of 60 degrees, positive one-half. Excuse me, it's not really 60 degrees. It's 300 degrees. Notice that's why they went through this demonstration to say that the ray OR is a 300-degree rotation. Because what I'm really going to do to figure out the coordinates of point R is I'm going to call it the cosine of 300 degrees, comma, the sine of 300 degrees. And the sine is negative in the fourth quadrant. So if you go into your calculator and you say the sine of 300 degrees, you'll get negative root 3 over 2. Okay. So all of these points on the circumference of the unit circle are all cosine of theta, comma, sine of theta, but we need the positive angle, not the negative angle. I can use the negative angle and say if the cosine of minus 60 degrees, comma, the sine of minus 60 degrees, that gives us the same answer. It's still 1 half, comma, minus root 3 over 2. So I don't necessarily have to use my positive angle. I could use my negative angle just as easily. In other words, the x-coordinate is the cosine of minus 60. It is important to realize that that's a negative angle if I'm going to use that as my angle. And the sine of negative 60. And that will give you those two answers. Now, to get to 756, is there nothing I can do but go backwards and backwards twice? Um, usually, you should be able to press the show I don't, see a, I don't see an arrow for the next problem. Oh, I see. Here, I can do this. That's what the fastest way to get to the next one is. Okay, that's just a two-click step. All right. All right. 
This question is the secret of the unit circle and trick. I'm presuming that somebody has told you you are going to have to remember the unit circle, all 16 points on it. Correct? Uh, usually it's, uh, we kind of just memorize like 30, 45, and 60. That's and right. That's 16 points. Yeah. Gonna, I'm going to put up a, in other words, when I'm looking at an angle like 30 degrees, okay, if I go to my second quadrant, and I have a 150 degree angle as measured by this. It creates the same reference triangle as my first one does. And that's 30 degrees, right? In other words, it's got to be supplementary. Mm -hmm. Well, their question is, what angle in the first quadrant could you use if you were given an angle of, say, 150 degrees? That would be the equivalent of a 30 degree first quadrant angle. Here's the way it works. Whatever the reference angle is, in other words, let's take a ray that's like this where that is 225, okay? When they say, what is the first quadrant, what angle would help you solve this, they're asking you about this angle right there. Well, what is that angle? If it's 180 degrees to get to there, what is theta? Uh, 45. Aha. And so you end up with some key formulas that you want to memorize. In this quadrant, it's a 180 minus theta gives you your equivalent first quadrant angle. In this third quadrant, it's theta minus 180. And in the fourth quadrant, it's 360 minus theta. So is all you do to answer A is that's fourth quadrant, right? Mm -hmm. 330 is fourth quadrant. Well, substitute it for that, and our equivalent first quadrant angle is what? 30. Okay, good. Now the next one, 120. What quadrant is that in? Uh, second. What is its equivalent first quadrant angle? Uh, 60. And 113, that's in the second quadrant. What's its equivalent? Um, 67. And finally, 203, which quadrant is that in, and what is it its equivalent angle? Uh, 23. Yeah. And you get all of those by these three formulas. So here's the kicker. They make... They may want you to memorize the 16 slots on the unit circle, and they do, <laughs> but you really only have to memorize the 30, the 45, and the 60, because every other angle can be referenced by a first quadrant angle. In other words, if I give you 330, you're not going to do your trig based on 330. You're going to do your trig based on 30. And whatever the answers for 30 for sine and cosine are, that's what your absolute value is going to be. And then you put a plus or minus sign based on which quadrant it's in. Have you seen all students take calculus? No. What that means is that in the first quadrant, all trig functions are positive. In the second quadrant, only sine is positive. And, of course, it's reciprocal. So there really should be and cosecant. The T stands for tangent. Only 
tangent is positive in the third quadrant. And of course, it's reciprocal cotangent. And in the fourth quadrant, C stands for cosine. It's the only positive trig along with secant. Okay. So let's say we had this question. What is the sine of 330 degrees? Well, the first thing I do is say, well, what's the equivalent first quadrant angle? It's 30. Well, I know the sine of 30 is 1 half. So I've got the correct number. Now, what is its plus or minus sign? Is it plus or minus? Plus. Minus, because it's actually 330 degrees, which is in the fourth quadrant. And in the fourth quadrant, sine is minus. Okay? So that's the way you're going to do all unit circle problems. And they're easy if you do them this way. Let me give you another one. This is so important, I can't stress that we want to do more of these. Let's figure out the cosine of 225. What is the equivalent? This is always the first step. What's the equivalent first quadrant angle? Uh, 45. Okay. Cosine of 45 is root 2 over 2. Now, what quadrant is that in? In other words, I still have to put a plus or minus on this. Uh, the third. Is cosine plus or minus in the third? Minus. That's what I do. That's exactly the way I solve every single question that I'm going to get. And trust me, you're going to get a lot of these. You're going to get sines, cosines, tangents of all the multiples of 30, 45, and 60 degrees. Okay. Now, I, the one thing I didn't cover was the quadrangle. Okay, the quadrangles being 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees. Remember what the coordinates of this is. Cosine of theta, comma, sine of theta. Well, on the unit circle, what are the actual coordinates of that? Zero, one. It's one, zero. Oh, yeah. Right? So yeah. that tells you what the cosine of zero degrees is. It's one. And it tells you the sine of zero degrees is zero. Now let's go up to this point. What are the coordinates on that point? One, zero. And that's 90 degrees. Tell me what the cosine of 90 degrees is. Oops, we got them backwards. It's not 1, 0. It's oh, zero, 0, 1. Right? The x coordinate is 0. The y coordinate is 1. So what's the cosine of 0? Mm. Uh, not 0, 90. Uh, zero. What's the sine of 90? One. Okay. Now let's look at 180 degree. Another quadrangle. You know what I mean by quadrangle? Uh-huh. Multiples of 90. Okay. What are the x and y coordinates on this point? Um, negative one, zero. So tell me what the cosine of 180 degrees is. Negative one. What's the sine of 180 degrees? Zero. That's what we're going to do all the way around. Coordinates on that point are zero comma negative one, and that's 270 degrees. So what's the cosine of 270? Zero. And the sine of 270? Negative one. There you go. You have all your quadrangles now. And this is a good way to memorize because you always know what that point is right there. That point is 1, 0. 
and this point is 0 comma 1 and this point is minus 1 comma 0. So as long as you know that the first coordinate, the x coordinate is cosine of theta and the second coordinate is sine of theta, then this answers all your quadrants. Now, once you know your quadrangles and your multiples of 30 and 45, there's your 16 points. They want you to memorize that point for 30 degrees. They want you to memorize this point for 45 degrees. And they want you to memorize this point for 60 degrees. They want you to memorize that point for 90 degrees all the way around the circle. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4 times 4. That's where I get 16. In other words, here's the unit circle as drawn by them. And a lot of trig classes will just give you this thing and say memorize it. And memorize every point. Well, the cosine of 30 degrees is square root of 3 over 2. Sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. So that's my point on the unit circle. 45 degrees is root 2 over 2, comma, root 2 over 2. Now, like I said, the easiest way to memorize the other 12 points is to memorize the first quadrant only. In other words, know what your sine and cosine of 30, 45, and 60 degrees are. And then every other angle that might be in the second, third, or fourth quadrant can be put in terms of a first quadrant angle. So you can figure out what the numbers are and then using a all students take calculus, I can put the correct plus or minus sign on it. And that's the way you're going to do all of them. Let's do one more. Tangent of 225. What's its equivalent angle? Let's write it like this so there's no confusion. Uh, tangent 45. Okay. What is the tangent of 45 equal to? Uh, Just 1. Now it's in the third quadrant. What is its plus or minus sign? Plus. That's the tangent of 225. It's exactly the same as the tangent of 45. It's 1. Okay. So okay. this is a very valuable lesson that we're doing today because it is going to solve the biggest problem in trig for you or for anybody. And that is how to answer a series of problems like uh, sine of 120, what's the cosine of 150, what's the tangent of um, 210, what's the uh, sine of 300. You should be able to do every one of these now. Okay? In other words, the fact that none of these angles are in the first quadrant does not matter. Tell me what the equivalent first quadrant angle is for that one. Um, 90 or 60. It's 180 minus 120. So it's 60. And then what's the sine of 60 equal to? Uh, one. Here's two triangles that will always answer all of your first quadrant answers. It's the two triangles they've been teaching you for three years. What you need to memorize are these dimensions outside the triangles. 
That one is 3060. This one is 4545. That's 1. That's 1. That's square root of 2. Now, between those two triangles, you can figure out sine, co all six trig functions of 30, 45, and 60 degrees. Right? Yeah. What's the sine of 45 degrees? You need to remember um. Sokotoa. That also is huge. Some of these things you just cannot get by without memorizing. That's one of them. These two triangles are another one. So what's the sine of 45 degrees? Uh, square root of 2 divided by 2. Okay. And it's even permissible to say 1 over square root of 2. I don't know about your teacher, but most trig teachers these days do not care whether you rationalize the ratio or not. In other words, typically they wouldn't like having an irrational denominator, so they would rationalize it and that would become root 2 over 2. But this is perfectly acceptable by me and most strict teachers that I know. And so this triangle over here, the answer really is 1 over root 2, directly from the triangle. You chose to rationalize it, which is fine. I got no problem with root 2 over 2 is the same number. But notice how any 30, 45, or 60 degree angle, you can figure out all six trig functions. Okay. So now go back up here to the first problem I got, sine of 60. What's that equal to? Um, it's a uh, square root of 3 over 1. Over 2. It's always uh, over, over the hypotenuse if it's sine and cosine. So it's square root of 3 over 2. Now what is its plus or minus sign? And this is the exact step that I recommend you do it. This is the same sequence that I always use. I figure out what its first quadrant angle is. I figure out what its absolute value is, and then I attach the plus or minus sign as the last step. Well, what quadrant are we in? Two. Is sign plus or minus in quadrant two? Plus. Let's go to the next problem. What's that equivalent first quadrant angle? 30. What's the cosine of 30? Look at our triangle over here. Um, square root of uh, 3 divided by 2. Correct. Correct. That's no accident. The sine of 60 is always going to be the, sine, the same as the cosine of 90 degrees minus that angle. So the fact that the sine of 60 is the same number as the cosine of 30, it always is. However, What's the plus or minus sign? Because we're dealing with cosine in which quadrant? The second. So what's its plus or minus sign? Negative. Okay, the next one. What's its equivalent angle? 30. What's the tangent of 30? Um. Don't, don't rationalize it. Just, just read it straight off of that triangle. Remember, tangent is opposite over adjacent. It's a 1 over the square root of 3. Okay. What quadrant are we in? The third. What's tangent in the third? Positive. The le next one. What's the equivalent first quadrant angle? 60. Sine of 60, we already know, is square root of 3 over 2. Is it a plus or a minus? Um, minus. Because it's sine in the fourth quadrant. And finally, that one's the same as the tangent of 30. We know the tangent of 30 is 1 over square root 3. Plus or minus? Uh, minus. You got it.
I think you know how to do the entire unit circle. You should. You have enough information that we've gone over today for you to place all 16 spots. Remember the X coordinate is the cosine of theta, the Y coordinate is the sine of theta. And that's all you need to do to fill out those 16 spots. So you just memorized your unit circle. Notice the difference between the way the school tells you to memorize it. They give you a circle with 16 slots on it and they say memorize this. Whereas the way I have asked you to memorize it is I say memorize these two triangles. Well, that triangle only has three pieces of information. This triangle only has three pieces of information. That 180 minus theta and theta minus 180 and 360 minus theta, that's three pieces of information only. All students take Calculus is four pieces of information. In other words, by memorizing these groups of three or four pieces of information allows you to extend it so that you can fill out a unit circle that has 16 slots on it. It's similar to if I gave you a credit card, a 16-digit credit card number, no way are you memorizing that as 16 consecutive digits, right? Yeah. You're going to break it up into four digits. You're going to memorize the first four, then you're going to memorize the next four, and then so forth and so on. So the human brain does not handle quantities greater than about seven. Uh, that's why phone numbers originally came out as seven digits, is because psychologists knew that people could memorize a seven-digit number. But the moment you get beyond seven, if I give you a 12-digit number to memorize, that becomes extremely difficult unless you break it up. If you break it up into three groups of four, not so hard to memorize. Same thing with a 16-digit number. Break it up into four groups of four and then memorize each of those four groups. That's the way to memorize trig, at least the, the unit circle. All right. Um, I guess we're done with this problem, are we? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was 756. Let's go to 757. Okay, hold on. I'm using this neat little new tool that I didn't even know I had until today, which allows me to draw directly on your piece of paper, which is actually kind of nice. I don't have to rewrite every stuff. The secret to this problem is to express one-eighth and one-half in the same base. Notice that 1 eighth is 2 to the minus third power. That's the way I'm writing 1 eighth. And it's still, so you see where that's 2 to the minus 3 power? Yeah. Okay. Still has that exponent. And how can I write 1 half using the base 2? Uh, 2 to the negative 1. It still has the same exponent. Now apply the rules of exponents. What does the left side become? Negative 6x plus 9. And what does the right side become? Or negative x minus 2. Now we've got the same base to one exponent equals the same base to a different exponent, that means I can say minus 6x plus 9 has to be equal to minus x minus 2. And now that's a simple equation to solve. 
end up with 5x equals 7 or equal 11 x equals 11 fifths. Okay. This, have you had logs? Have we done logs? Yeah. Typically, when you have your variable in the exponent, it's a log problem. Okay. Except in very certain situations, where the bases can be expressed with the same common exponential base. In this case, I was able to express one-eighth as two to some power, and I was able to express one-half as two to some power. And so, by being able to write everything using the exponential base two, allows me to solve this problem make that one-half a one-third, and then I can't use this technique. There's no way I can turn one-third and express it as two to any power. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Let me give you another example. Hold on a second. Got to remember to pull it up or I can write on it. Let's say 9 to the x power equals 27 to the 3x minus 1. Now, this looks like a log problem, right? I'd take the natural log of both sides, and then I could bring the x down in front, and I could bring the 3x minus 1 down in front. But this fits that case where I can express both 9 and 27 as their common exponential base. What is their common exponential base? Uh, 3. Okay, so how do I write the left side of the equation? 3 to the power of 3 times that. 3 squared. Very first oh, yeah. thing to do is to write 9 as a power of 3 and always put it in parentheses. The parentheses are very important there. And I'll get to that in a second. How can I write 27? 3 to the power of 3. Uh, parentheses. To the power of 3 exponential. Right. Now use your rules of exponents. What do you get? 2x equals... Um, 9x minus 3. Now you got the same bases. You can equate the exponents. So the last thing is 2x equals 9x minus 3. Okay? Uh -huh. Now, let me show you something interesting. Why the parentheses are so important here. What do you suppose the difference between these two numbers is? Have I showed you this before? I think so. Pretty interesting, actually. Very interesting. If I do not have parentheses, then I have to start from the top down. In other words, I do that part first, which is 4, and then I take 2 to the 4th power, which is 16. Okay? Okay. Now, when I look at the threes, I got to do that part first. So this becomes three to the twenty seventh power, which is seven trillion. It's a seven with twelve zeros behind it. So how odd is it that These two numbers, 3 to the 3 to the 3, and 2 to the, the 2 to the 2, could be separated by 7 trillion. But they are. And why this is just an interesting piece of uh, numerology is that when mathematicians want to talk about big numbers, really big numbers, they don't actually always use scientific notation they use this kind of notation. They write it like this. That's 3 up arrow, 3 up arrow, 3. OK? 
Okay. And they use three, not two, because look at how big you can make a number using three. Mm -hmm. It immediately goes to seven trillion, whereas two only went to 16. Not 16 trillion, but just 16. So imagine if I have a number like three to the three to the three to the three. Well, I start top down, so that becomes 27. And then three to the 27th becomes seven trillion. So now I'm taking three to the seven trillionth power. So that's the power of these exponentiation without parentheses. Notice there's a tremendous difference if I put parentheses around these. In other words, if I put parentheses like we've been doing, well, then that's just three to the ninth. It's a big number, but it's not seven trillion. Okay. And now if I put parentheses around that, it doesn't actually change anything. It becomes four squared, which is still 16. So when you're looking at twos, the parentheses aren't really needed. But when you're looking at any other numbers bigger than two, the parentheses make all the difference in the world. Fifty-seven. Whoops, that was the one we just did. I guess I want to go to seven point one point five. Let's see if we can get one more problem done. What kind of calculator do you have currently? 84. Okay. You know how to put it in degree mode or radian mode? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Let me pull mine out. Mine no longer works. The battery died and it uh, would not reboot when I replaced the batteries. So you push the mode key. When you push the mode key and you go down four, I think to the fourth row, it lets you switch between degrees and radians, if you didn't know. It is extremely useful to know which one you're in and very problematic to try to, if you think you're in degrees and you're putting in radians or vice versa. So if you ever forget, just type sine of 30. Do you have your calculator there? Mm -hmm. What's it give you? Sine of 30, enter. 0.5. Tells you. If you were not in degrees, you would not get 0.5. Because 30 degrees is the same as pi over 6. So... Put your calculator in radian mode now and type sine of pi over 6. Point 0.5. Got the same answer. So as long as you know what you're in, degrees or radians, then you're fine. Um, most all mistakes that can be made are made because a person thinks he's in degrees and he's actually in radians or vice versa. So make sure you know what you're in. Um, the Inspire tells you. I don't think the TI-84 tells you, does it? It doesn't say degrees or radians, or does it? Maybe it does. No. no, I don't think it did. You kind of have to always go to mode and check to see what you're in. Or the quick way to do it is take the sine of 30 and if it says one half you're in degree mode. If it says anything else you're in radian mode. Alright. Nicholas, I'm going to let you go. Okay. Hopefully this trig will help you a lot. It should. It certainly yeah. solves one huge problem and that's you've got the unit circle memorized or you should have at this point. Mm -hmm. All right. Talk to you next time. Bye.